morning. We are about to begin. Please be seated. Can you hear me? You're breaking up. Yo, what's going on? Ah, there you are. So we were talking about all the work we've been doing on intelligence. And I know you have a solid marketing plan, web ads and lead gen. But we need something different. OK, what are, you, what are you thinking? We need a viral video. <laughs> a viral video? No, dude. No thanks. It'll be great. People won't know what hit them. Don't platform for disruption me, OK, bro? Get back to coding. We're all good. It'll be the best thing since Gangnam Style. This is why we got you a therapy bunny, okay? No. You know what? You don't need to do anything. Evan. My team will handle Thing everything. On. It's going to be great. Evan. You'll see. Yo. Okay, so we have planking and the ice bucket thing. I'm not sure about Tide Pods. Can't you die from eating them? Okay, well, how are we going to get across our vertical features? The mannequin challenge. Fantastic. Um, and what about global financials? Um, what about the uh, Dorito bag? What's that? You fill up a bathtub with Doritos, and you just lay on it. And then what? That's it. Sounds very dumb. Perfect. The floor is lava. Sweet people. Sleep over? Sweet people. We're purple? Um, no. You kind of put your head in your arm and then lower it, you know, sort of like this. Maybe we just skip this one. Uh, wait, wait. Can you do that again? I wasn't recording. Really? Well, here goes. I nominate Jim McGeever to take the ice bucket challenge. <laughs> Peanut butter in. Next Gen Analytics. Next Gen Analytics. Hey, guys. What are you doing? The mannequin challenge. No, 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 no. You just look like you're working. You have to do something like this. Wow, Larry is going to love this. Open Gangnam Style. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Vice President of Development, Evan Goldberg. Gangnam Style. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's grow time and plank time. Um, my children saw that video and they were like, Dad, 
That's it. We're out of the will. Uh, welcome to day two of Sweet World. Really excited to see all of you today. Um, so, oh, look at that. Besides the best product, we're delivering the largest and most colorful legal disclaimer. Uh, so, we're going to talk about a bunch of new capabilities that we're working on on the product team today. This is the eighth sweet world that I've come up and, and done that, and um, I think you're going to love what we're showing today. I, you know, um, when we think about why we're doing what we're doing and what we deliver to customers, we kind of think about the keys to growth that NetSuite can help you with. And there's sort of five of them, and you'll see this weaved throughout the presentation. And this is Vegas, so if you want, you can have a drinking game. Every time I mention one of these, take a drink. Um, you'll enjoy the presentation even more. Uh, so automation. I mean, that's number one. Why do you implement ERP systems and CRM systems? Uh, it's basic, you know, it's this ultimately to save you time. And, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of great things we're doing with automation uh, today. Insight. I mean, again, you put all this data in the system, you want to get the data out of the system. You want to get great insight into how you can operate your business better. As your business grows, you have more people. It's not three people in a room where you can kind of control things by voice. Um, you have a ton of employees working on a bunch of different things, and control is an incredibly important part of making your business run efficiently. But we know that the only constant is change, and the agility of a system to be able to change as your company changes, as circumstances changes, is critical for success. And then finally, collaboration. And this is where we think we really shine, because it's one system. Everybody's working sort of off of the same playbook. Um, it's in, collaboration is more than sending emails and tweets. I mean, it's really about business processes, crossing departments, everybody working together uh, towards the same goals. So as you uh, watch some of the things we're demonstrating today, see if you hear a little bit of this. And again, if you do, take a drink. Uh, so we show this every year. Uh, you know, we're growing the team just like we were growing it in the past. Every year it gets better. We're going to hire more people into R&D in 2018 than, than ever before. And so that's, you know, an exponential curve of investment. And um, if you integrate under the curve, it's a little shout out to all you calculus fans out there. I'm sure there's a couple of them. Um, we've invested over a billion dollars in R&D uh, for NetSuite. And Part of growth, and this is going to be true for your companies, it's certainly true for our company, part of growth in remaining vibrant is reinvention. We're aggressive about saying, you know what, in this area we're going to start from scratch, learn from what we did before, and redo it even better. And we're going to be leapfrogging our own technology. So that's like the next step beyond planking is self-leapfrogging. It's uh, I try it sometime. Um, Here's some examples of things that we really are reinventing from scratch. Sweet Commerce, we took our original web store technology, uh, everything we learned, and built it into a brand new uh, commerce capability. Sweet Analytics, we're going to show some of that today, where we took what we learned from search and reporting and built a brand new uh, way to get insights out of your data. Sweet Tax, we realized that as we went global, the way we were doing taxes wasn't going to scale. We redid taxes from scratch. Craig's going to talk about that a little bit later. The Sweet Cloud Development Framework. This is a brand new way, and we've been working on it for several years, to build extensions to NetSuite. And using team development capabilities, the latest IDEs, um, again, we redid it from scratch. And Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. We're reconceiving how we're going to deliver the service. Um, we were in the data center business in a while. We're getting out of the data center business. And we're going to use all the capabilities of Oracle's public cloud to deliver the best possible experience for our users. So that's a huge investment, you know, the reinvention. But it's really not about us. I mean, it's about helping you to grow and succeed. And we're thrilled with the, with the feedback that we're getting um, from our customers. And we really do listen. We'll talk a little bit later about how you can give us even more feedback. But customers say, you've automated taking 100 hours to 40. I've been leveraging the real-time insights I get out of NetSuite. I've been able to scale my business very quickly. And I'm working aligned across the company. So thank you for those 
uh, great kudos, and um, we'll keep trying to uh, deliver the types of capabilities that will, will make you give us great quotes. <laughs> so what I'm going to show today is just a sample of what we're working on. As I said, we have an enormous team. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the advances we're making in, in uh, six different areas. Uh, we're going to talk about verticals and uh, how you operate in your type of business, global financials, how you can grow internationally, human resources, how you manage your most important resource, which is people, technology, the things we're doing under the covers and in our platform to make NetSuite more effective for you, and analytics. Uh, this is a promise we made in Sweet World 1, and we're delivering on it, and we're going to hear about that today. And finally, we're really excited about to talk about the intelligent suite. So let's get started. So to grow, you need to streamline your op and automate your key operations. It's often determined by what vertical you're in. So let's talk about what we're doing to automate some of your key operational workflows. We're going to start with omnichannel commerce. It's critical for wholesale distributors, manufacturing, retail. And we have a unique unified ERP and commerce experience. Um, we, you know, B2C, you know, what people expect when they go on the web, is actually what B2B buyers are, are increasingly expecting also. And to show some of the great advances we're making here, I'd like to introduce Allison Eau Claire, the VP of Product Management for Commerce. Thank Thanks, Evan. So the commerce team is looking to help you grow in three different ways. First, we're making our commerce solutions easier to implement, upgrade, and extend, increasing the performance and reliability of our solutions, and empowering you to be in the driver's seat of your commerce experience. Let's take a look at each one a bit more. So last year, we introduced the pilot of Sweet Commerce, a new addition to the commerce family that marries the modern commerce platform of Sweet Commerce Advanced with the ease and simplicity of Site Builder. This year, I am thrilled to announce the general availability of Sweet Commerce in the United States. You can focus on running your business with beautiful ready-made themes, advancements in site management tools, KPIs, and dashboards, while we have you covered with automatic upgrades that keep you up to date at all times. And with the introduction of Sweet Success for Commerce, we can have you up and running in 30 days with pre-configured templates and e-commerce leading practices for B2B, for B2C, as well as a combined offering that brings e-commerce in-store and ERP. Here you can see a great example of a site recently launched wholesale distribution site by Sugarfina. It looks fantastic and was in less than 30 days. And the best part of all, as Jim announced yesterday, if for the first 1,000 customers who sign up for Sweet Commerce, we will include a Sweet Success for Commerce implementation at no additional cost. So please come visit us to learn more at Commerce Connect and Grow in the Expo. Next, we also know that it's critical to your commerce experience that there's an ecosystem around uh, your commerce offering. And powering that ecosystem is the Commerce Extension Framework, which we also announce as generally available today. Using the framework, developers can create reusable themes and extensions for both Sweet Commerce and Sweet Commerce Advanced. And business users can use those extensions to add capabilities to their websites easily without technical help and still upgrade. We are using this framework ourselves at NetSuite and the product team delivering extensions, some of which are available now, some of which will be available in the coming months in the form of both functional components as well as third-party technology integrations. And uh, partner developers as well as customer developers can use these same development tools to create your own extensions and grow the community. Next, we heard loud and clear from you that when it comes to the in-store experience, you need to be able to transact no matter what, even if your internet connection is down. And so with the new Sweet Commerce in-store offline mode available in 18.1, you don't have to worry. With just your tablet, uh, SCIS will detect if there's a connection issue and prompt you automatically to go into fallback mode. Once your connection is available again, it will automatically reconcile all of those transactions back to NetSuite. 
and a great benefit of this architecture change is that we're seeing performance improvements online from using it as well, with some steps being as much as 70 to 80% faster than previously. It also enables new models to help you grow, such as pop-up stores. And finally, we understand that you want to have control of your commerce experience, and so we are committed to continuing to deliver the business user tools to help you do that, including new capabilities that we're working on to help you more easily schedule the launch of new products, categories, and campaigns, personalize the experience both for B2B customers as well as for B2C, create unified email and browse recovery capabilities, and keep your finger on the pulse of your business at all times with insight uh, through merchandise hierarchy reporting. We also understand that having unified omnichannel conversations with your customers is critical. From a B2B standpoint, your omnichannel is different, but no less vital. It's about having, letting your customers have their digital experience, go online, seamlessly transition to interacting with your sales representatives, customer service agents, and partners. So we're committed to delivering the cross-channel processes and great user experiences for your sales and customer service staff. Let's take a look at some of these capabilities we're, looking at, we're working on uh, in action in a day in the life scenario. In this segment of the demo, we'll see how Norso, a distributor of sporting goods, is growing and they're expanding into a new line of home goods that are nature inspired. First, we'll set up the merchandise hierarchy with all the items for reporting. We'll set up our category and landing page to launch, and then personalize the views of the catalog for our customers. Let's take a look. So as the Norso Merchandising Manager, I've already begun to prepare for the launch by creating my items and classifying them in the merchandise hierarchy. Earlier in the year, uh, we had test marketed some outdoor accessories. You can see I already created this home goods category. And now I'm going to take those items that I test marketed and move them to the home goods tree. So all I need to do is click on that node and change the parent to home goods. And then as I save, you can see that it's automatically moved over to the home goods branch. You can also click to see more details on the items. More on the reporting based on this in a minute. Fast forward, the launch is almost here. And so logging into site management tools, I will go ahead and set up the category navigation. So you can see that I've actually already set up the home goods category navigation, which I'll do in addition to setting up the merchandise hierarchy so that all of the navigation paths are covered. And I set it to go live on May 15th. I don't have to be there until midnight the night before. It will automatically go live on the date and time that I set. So that's fantastic. Next, I'll create a landing page to tell my customers more about the new line. So I will set that also to go live on May 15th in conjunction with categories. I'll go ahead and add some great metadata for SEO so that customers can find my new line using search engines, and select a landing page template into which I'll drag and drop my content. Now let's go ahead and put in the content. I am so thrilled that I can combine this B2C-like discovery experience with the B2B ordering features that my customers need. Adding a picture, some text, as well as a link to the category page for more information, customers will be able to discover the line. And I can do this point and click, no HTML skills required. Next, I want to encourage my customers to stock certain assortments in their stores. So using the featured products extension, I'll add a good, better, and best assortment to the page. Saving that, I also want to encourage my customers to go with the better assortment or more, and so I'll create a promotional banner and drag that in to encourage them to go with better or above with free merchandising materials that will automatically be added with a new auto-add free gift feature. One more look, and my landing page is ready to go too. Finally, I will want to make sure that the content and categories show up for the right customers. I've already created customer segments, and so now in the home goods category, I'll make sure that the sporting goods retailers are not assigned. If they want to sell this new line, they need to get authorization first. Next, going to the home goods category, as I save, I want to make sure that, sport, that uh, the sporting goods category, I want to make sure that home goods retailers and interior designers are not assigned. Now, let's preview to make sure that the content shows up correctly. First, we'll preview as a sporting goods retailer, 
you can see that the home good is targeted, the home page is targeted to sporting goods, and the home goods line does not appear. Now previewing as a home goods retailer, you can see that the home page is targeted for home goods, and only the home goods category tree appears. My site is ready to go, so I'll tell my salespeople to get selling and launch my email campaign. <laughs> so I hope you've seen in this first segment that we're really putting the power in your hands to control your e-commerce experience. So you've seen how we prepared for the launch. Now let's see how the customer experiences the launch and collaborates with their sales representative. So it's now May 15th, and Catherine, the owner of The Natural Home, receives the email announcing the new line. She's really excited about it and clicks through this email to learn more. She comes right to the landing page and it has great content that's tailor-made for her. She can see the different assortments that are available and takes a little bit of a look at that. She loves the B2C like discovery experience that's combined with B2B ordering. So she looks at the assortments and then decides to click through to the category page to learn a little bit more. She's thinking about what she wants. Meanwhile, Sam, back at the office, who's the sales rep for the natural home, gets an alert on his dashboard. He can see that Catherine has clicked through the email and that she has also browsed the landing and the category page. He decides to give her a call and see if he can help her choose the right option for her. He creates a quote that she can view later. So later in that day, Catherine has a moment and takes a look at the quote that Sam has created for her online. Um, she's able to easily access her quotes and take a look at what Sam put together. And she can see that the medium assortment looks like it really is the right thing for her. The best part is she doesn't have to wait for Sam to move forward. She can simply click convert this quote to an order by verifying the payment method is by invoice and submitting her order. She also then gets a transactional email confirmation that was sent via Bronto. She's so happy that Norso is really easy to do business with. Finally, the, fast forward a little bit more, and as the merchandising manager, I want to see how we're doing since we launched a few weeks ago. With the new merchandise hierarchy-based reporting, I can see where I stand at any time. So this is based on Suite Analytics, which you'll see a little bit more of in the keynote, but we're giving you a sneak peek right now to see how we're applying it within the suite. I can see how many I've sold, how many I have on hand and on order for all the categories, and then drill down into home goods to see for the specific products how I'm doing. The merchandise hierarchy reports really help me know exactly where I stand and keep my finger on the pulse of my business. So there we go, and finally, you see now that in the first segment we prepared for the launch, here we were able to do the launch and see that collaboration with the B2B customer and their sales rep to really help Norso grow. So thank you everybody, back to you, Evan. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. She, she always gets the coolest demos. I'm always envious. <laughs> okay, well, another thing that product companies have to deal with, obviously, besides uh, interacting with your customers, is interacting with your supply chain. And, and growth for companies like retailers, distributors, and manufacturers means moving more product. You need to make or buy the right product in the right quantities, get them to the right places at the right time. And you need to do that efficiently, you need to do that with high quality. And always, always do more of it. So, you know, we want more. We want growth. But growth can be hard. How do you keep your warehouse efficient when you have 1,000 shipments a day when you used to have 100? How do you ensure product quality when you move from 25 SKUs to 500 SKUs? How do you keep all your employees and departments working together and coordinated when you grow from 50 employees to 500? So we're delivering new features uh, to, across your operations to help with these challenges of growth. We're going to talk about inventory tracking and availability, warehouse management and notification and automation, uh, quality monitoring and management, product change management. So let's go through the story of an outsourced manufacturer who makes and sells air conditioners. And they just released a new model. So, to know how much you need to buy or make, you need insight into what the state of the different products are in. So here we have our model 800 air conditioner. It's a new product. We just introduced it, and there's high demand. 
our sales rep calls asking how many units are available to sell. And, and the inventory clerk has to take a look and see uh, how much is available. They take a look by location. Yeah, we have some available. Which of these really are ready um, to sell to the customer? And so with our new inventory status feature, you can actually drill down and see that there's a certain number of units that are OK, and there's other units that are not good, that are returned, or that need to be inspected, or that are damaged. So we actually don't have um, any available to sell. So it, it's time to get some more. So what does that involve? That involves receiving. Uh, and NetSuite WMS Mobile will give a, a new UI optimized for the warehouse to enable you to scan and efficiently receive, put away, or pick. So let's take a look at what our warehouse operator does is we see, receive more of these air conditioners. They have a mobile device, and they get a shipment uh, on the loading dock. Um, and they can use their mobile device to actually scan that shipment. So they look at purchase orders. They scan the number of the purchase order. And there it is. So it's uh, some Model 800 air conditioners. Now, Here's where the inventory status comes in again. We're not going to say that those are immediately good. We're going to say those are pending inspection. And we're going to click OK on our handheld device. And now our PO is received. So what happens next? So now we have some air conditioning units that need to be inspected. And your person in, terms, uh, in charge of quality management is going to use our quality features with their tablet to enter inspection data directly into NetSuite while doing the inspection. So here's what the quality manager sees. There's a list of uh, items that they need to inspect. They can filter it um, to the items that are specifically, here's, here's all the items that they need to inspect. They can, fi they can filter it to the items that are, just, that are just theirs, my items. And they see that there's uh, some new items that, they, uh, that, are, that are pending inspection. So the, let's go ahead and do the inspection. And that involves looking at the pressures. Uh, you know, those of you that are into air conditioning inspection, I'm sure this is very familiar to you. <laughs> and uh-oh, one of the pressures is bad. See, so highlighted that the high-end pressure is too high. And we're going to record a picture to show that this unit actually failed, uh, failed inspection. And now it's been quarantined using inventory status. An email has been sent to the person in charge of engineering change. Uh, to figure out what to do next. So maybe we've seen this periodically, and we're thinking that maybe we need to change how we build these air conditioning units. How are we going to do that? Well, you need to be agile, drink, um, and you need to adapt. Uh, when you make changes to your products and your processes, you need to ensure that all your departments are aligned and collaborating, drink. Uh, <laughs> Changes are documented and routed for analysis, approval, and implementation. Let's look, take a look at how that works. Let's take a look at the engineering change order. So the engineering change order record allows you to record a change that you're going to make to your processes. So first, you have to record uh, what type of change this is. And here, we're going to, we realize that there's a better way to build these air conditions. We're going to use a different compressor. So we put a description of the change that we're going to make. And now we're actually going to record that we need to make a change to the bill of materials. So we say we're going to replace an item in the bill of materials, the old compressor that seems to be failing, with a new compressor that we think is going to work a lot better. Um, so, that, so we record that change and what the new revision of the bill of materials um, is going to be. We're going to add that change to the record. But there's more that we have to do. Um, we can see that the, the details on the change that we're making, but there's more that we need to do, because this is going to require collaboration across the organization. We're going to have to tell the QA engineers that they need to test these new compressors more often because they're new. The procurement team needs to order more because we're going to be building uh, with this new compressor. And the documentation team needs to update the installation guide about how uh, you're going to actually uh, install these compressors. This change order is ready, but it needs to be approved. Another example of collaboration, drink. I, I really won't say that anymore. Um, <laughs> And so once it's approved, it's actually going to execute those bill of material changes in, and, uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the product. And everybody that's building the next generation of air conditioners will be using uh, this new approach. 
So these and other features we're, we're working on will enable you to scale your supply chain and operations as you grow. So that's a lot. Oh, good. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so that's great. So all the, all the product company people are clapping, and all the services company people are like, well, what's in this keynote for me? Um, so we've talked about operations for companies that sell products. Maybe they sell on the web, and they, and they build products. Let's shift to talk about operations for companies that deliver talent. So growth for agencies, professional services firms, software companies means getting the right people on the right projects and delivering them with quality on time and on budget. And always, same as with product companies, delivering more than you did the quarter before. So just same story. Growth can be painful. Same kinds of questions you have to answer as you grow. How do you make sure you have the right people on the right projects as you scale from 20 resources to 200? How do you manage projects, teams, profitability as you grow from one office to five and you move all around the world? How do you manage projects that are bigger, longer, and more complex than ever before? Well, a key to successfully managing your project growth is project accounting. So let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, it is what it sounds like. It's financial accounting and controls for projects. And it's really, really important to accounting and finance. But it's also operational insight. It's really necessary for project managers. Ultimately, of course, project managers are responsible for delivering projects on time, in budget, and profitably. So typically, the data comes from multiple systems. You sort of have to manually manage your project accounting differently across uh, different organizations. Um, and often it's done in spreadsheets, and often it's done, it's done twice. Um, and Net, now, so NetSuite is solving this. We're unifying all of the necessary data. We're building in agile automation. Pause. Give you flexibility to decide the right rules for your company. We'll deliver the accounting and financial controls that finance and accounting needs, and the operational insight that project managers need, enabling them to collaborate. All right, let's take a look at an example. Um, Intercompany labor. So staffing resources across subsidiaries is an example where we're building in agile automation of project accounting. Allows you to create rules to automatically calculate the financial accounting across the subs and give project managers the insight they need to understand the cost of the resources they're going to use. So this example is a record management's firm. And they have a project that they're executing. It's, a, uh, it's the fall campaign for a customer. And the first part of that is planning. So we have a project task, planning. And we need some resources on that. So we click on the Find Resources tab. We need what we actually need. We can do filters. We need an expertise in creative design. And we need 40 hours from that creative design resource. We're in the UK. There's nobody available. So we, we're, we're not going to be able to use our UK resources. Let's look and see if in another subsidiary, and we think maybe in the US subsidiary, which has a bunch of creative resources, there might be someone available. And sure enough, we see multiple resources that are available for 40 hours. We can look right in this search tool and see the transfer price that will be used. And obviously, we want to make this, uh, this a profitable project. So we're choosing one of the lower transfer prices. And we're going to submit that, and now that intercompany resource is assigned to this project task. We can see it there. We can see how much that's going to cost us. Once we save it, we can actually go to the intercompany tab on the project and see what intercompany resources we're using. And we can even drill down on each resource that we're using and understand the rules that are going to be used to do the accounting uh, for that project. So it really enables you to understand how that project is going to be accounted for, both you know, for finance managers and for, and for the project managers. So we've released a bunch of key features um, in project accounting. Many are available today. Um, advanced revenue management, charge-based billing. Um, we're really excited about some of the things we have planned. Um, it's going to expand the data in the suite. Work in progress is an incredibly important part of this. Um, so that when expenses are actually incurred, you can immediately sort of see the effect that they're going to have on that project, even if they cross um, accounting periods. Again, it's all about the insight for the accounting and finance team and for the project management team. Um, and these will automate many of your accounting processes that have been very manual and labor-intensive before. 
Companies are moving. To, oh, thank you. Thank you, great. We've got some service companies in the house. <laughs> uh, so many companies are moving to offer services on a subscription basis. Even product companies are using this because recurring billing can be a great enabler for growth. So pricing and billing exactly how you want can give you a big competitive advantage. We've shown a bunch about uh, uh, sweet billing in the past. We're going to show you some of the great features that we're adding to sweet billing over the coming versions. So one of the most important parts of billing is pricing. And really, you know, if you price, how you price is going to affect how your business performs. So we have a bunch of different pricing models available now. We're adding a number of pricing uh, models, things like introductory pricing, trial pricing, and commit plus overage. So let's take a look at how that actually works. So we have a record management firm. They've launched a new product that is not performing well. Um, sales thinks that introductory pricing will increase the win rate, and they want to test this model. So as a billing specialist, I need to create a subscription plan with the discount introductory pricing. How do I do that? So let's take a look at the price book record. You maybe have seen this before, and we're showing you some great enhancements in the great UI that we have for building price books. So there's a particular item, which is usage, and we think that maybe if we have some introductory pricing on usage, uh, we can improve our sales. So we're going to take a look at the file storage usage pricing. We're going to create tiered pricing, and it's going to be for an introductory interval of three months. So for the first, uh, for the introductory interval, up to, uh, up to 50, it's, uh, it's 50, it's 50 cents. And then beyond 50, we go um, to, uh, to 45 cents. So you're getting a quantity discount. That's just for the first three months. Now we want to enter the pricing for the next interval, which is going to be month four and after. So we enter the start month, month four. And we, uh, that's going to go to sort of more of, our, more of our standard pricing, a dollar up to 50 units. and uh, and, and 95 cents uh, after that. So now we can save that interval. And uh, we can quickly and easily now, without even opening the interval, see the details on that interval. And we can actually see a graph of sort of the summary or chart of the summary of the, of the different pricing um, on, in, the, in, this, in this price book. And if we're satisfied, uh, we, get, we'll, uh, we can actually filter and see only particular types of items, how is all of our usage pricing uh, in this price book uh, working? And um, when we're when we're satisfied, we're going to save this price book. It's going to get saved to the subscription plan. We see that now there's multiple uh, price books. On, we have the new the new introductory pricing. We also have a free a free trial offer. What's an, another type of pricing we might want to execute is commit plus overage. So let's get a commitment guaranteed revenue at a lower price, and then charge them overage to, to really you know, make sure that we don't um, you know, use more than we can actually handle in our capacity. So here's an example of a commit of 1,200 units. And then when they go over 1,200 units, they pay significantly more. We look at this customer. This customer calls in and says, this isn't working for me, and we can see why. They're always going over. Uh, so maybe if we change the commit price, it'll be a win-win. We'll have more guaranteed revenue, and they'll be able to uh, get that lower, that, lower, that lower pricing tier. So that's, so that's editing uh, the commit plus overage pricing, and we can see that that is now uh, working better for the customer. So great new pricing capabilities um, in, in, our, in suite billing. So next we're going to talk, oh, thanks. Yeah, I just, if I pause long enough, you'll, you'll cheer, because you're like, move it along, Evan. Um, <laughs> so next we're going to talk about an area that since uh, the merger with Oracle, we've put an enormous, enormous amount of investment in. And we're going to look at how we can improve your financial insight, automation, and controls around the world, or across the world, as it's known by Kyrie Irving. And uh, to tell you all about this, I'd like to introduce our expert in all things international, Craig Sullivan, GVP, Product Management for International. There you go, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, purple slide, a rain effect as I was coming on the stage. No prizes for guessing who my favorite musician is. So um, 
Good morning, everyone. Delighted to be here to talk about global financials. You may not realize, but the One World product, NetSuite One World product, turned 10 years old just this past week. And it's been a great success for us, and more importantly, a great success for you, because you're growing everywhere in the world. As Jim mentioned yesterday, we're seeing customers running their HQs and their subsidiaries in 199 countries and dependent territories all around the world today. More than 80% of the transactions in the NetSuite system are actually taking place outside of the United States. And even for our US HQ customers, we're seeing that you're transacting at um, almost two thirds of your transaction volumes outside of the United States as well. And when we look at the One World customer base in its entirety, we're seeing that more than 50% of you are actually running in multiple countries. <clears throat> so global capabilities are clearly important for a large number of our customers. And when you look at the statistics from the US Department of Commerce, they show that 90% of the international trade taking place from the United States is actually being performed by small and medium-sized enterprises. So this is a really important um, set of capabilities for everyone. Jim mentioned yesterday that our international customers are growing faster than our domestic customers. And a great example of that is Deliveroo that's operating in 12 countries and was ranked recently as the number one fastest growing company in the Deloitte Fast 50 in the UK, um, actually the fastest growing company in the 20 year history of that, that listing. And so far in 2018, first four months alone, you've added more than 9,000 new subsidiaries into the, the NetSuite system, far, growing faster than ever. So our international product vision of acting global and being local is, is clearly critical to your success and supporting your growth. And so we think about things like agility and uh, making sure that you can grow as, as easily as possible, driving automation and supporting you at global scale in the act global part of our product vision. And in the be local part of the product vision, we're thinking about taking you the last mile, making the user experience for your end users around the world really great helping you achieve your compliance challenges and reporting needs, and ensuring that you can reach those customers around the world that are really looking for your product or service. <clears throat> Specifically in the area of Act Global, we're continuing to invest in those capabilities. Intercompany framework, you just saw a great example of that in the services businesses, where we're enabling cross-subsidiary transactions and all of the accounting impacts behind the scenes that help your business. Global customers, so you can trade with your customers everywhere in the world. In the area of cash management, we're driving more automation and more capability to help you meet the local requirements as well as the efficiency needs in your organization. And capabilities specifically for the back office to make the period end process and the, the act of performing the accounting functions even more efficient. And last but certainly not least, we're enhancing our tax capabilities with Sweet Tax, and that's a major advancement for us this year. So we set the team a challenge. We said that we needed the sweet tax capabilities in their next iteration to handle any tax rule anywhere in the world, but be really easy to use for non-accountants across your organization. And I'm delighted to say that the team have hit the mark on every one of those uh, criteria. Sweet tax supports not just the key countries that we're operating in and you're, you're operating in, but also the more complex markets like Brazil, China, and India, all with a common user experience. We have real-time tax determination in over 140 countries. We have regular automated updates of those tax rates. And we've also got out-of-the-box reporting that allows you to have full, full auditability and drill down to the transaction level so you can see exactly how those taxes are calculated. And there's also the flexibility now for you to choose between a NetSuite native tax engine for a particular country and a particular requirement or a partner tax engine so that you have those options to basically define how you're going to calculate taxes exactly as you need to. And we've also added use tax capabilities for purchase transactions for US customers. So let's take a look at sweet tax in action. So here we are on the updated subsidiary record. You can see that we now have a tax registration subtab that shows all of the individual locations that this particular subsidiary is registered to calculate and report taxes in. We're capturing information about the tax agency, the tax registration number, and then also the selection for the tax engine. You can see we've selected NetSuite's VAT engine and NetSuite sales tax engine specifically for the, the United States California operation. Here we have the global customer record. 
we've added a subsidiaries tab to this record so you can actually define which of your subsidiaries you're going to interact with this customer through. In this case, the US, the UK, and a German subsidiary. And we'll take the German subsidiary and we'll actually enter a transaction for that subsidiary with this customer, Game Tech Computers. We've set some terms for them. The default is for the USA, but we're going to select the German subsidiary, as we mentioned. And then we're going to define the location as being Frankfurt. We're going to select the gaming laptop. We're going to select a keyboard to go along with that laptop. And we're going to go ahead and save that transaction. And what you'll see is that the sweet tax engine has determined that this needs to be transacted in Germany, and therefore tax is calculated in Germany. So when we pull up the copy of the invoice that you're going to send to your customer in Germany, it's a Rechnung. And we've got the terms information as well as the local summary and tax information there. So let's imagine the German customer is very happy with the, the laptop that we've just sent them. They've asked that their California office receive one of those laptops also. So we're going to go back into the original invoice. We're going to make a copy of that. And we're going to change the location to California and also select the California office address for this customer. And when we save this transaction, you'll see that now we have calculated all of the taxes for California with all of the detailed information about how that's broken down available in the tax details tab. So a great example there of a multinational tax situation that the Sweet Tax Engine is handling very, very seamlessly and easily without you having to think about taxes. Thank you. The team will be very happy to hear the applause. So it wouldn't be a product keynote and certainly the financial sections without a demo of a journal. We get to put it on the big screen. Um, but it's not just any journal demo. It's an automated journal demo this year. We've heard from many of you that you, you would like us to add a period end journal capability to support the needs of some of the international markets as well as some best practice that you would like to adopt in your organization. So we've implemented the ability to automate that process directly in the NetSuite product through the accounting period checklist. So here we are. We're in the Manage Accounting Period screen. We're going to drill into the checklist for December 2017. And we have a new entry here for Create Period Journal Entries. And when we go in here, we can see all of the subsidiaries for which this needs to be run. And we can see that we will have one sub for which we've not entered this uh, period end journal yet. We're going to click down into Create Journal Entries. We're going to select that subsidiary and submit. And this is going to go off and do the calculation to figure out exactly how much the journal adjustment should be. And when that's finished, we can drill in and see the results, take a look at exactly what adjustments were made. So this is the automated part, a journal without actually having to do a journal. And then we can drill down on each of those individual lines and see actually what transactions were incorporated into the journal adjustment so that, again, you've got a full auditable trail of how you actually reach the conclusions for this particular transaction. And then if you want to see what the carry forward balances are in your trial balance, we've added a new report, the post-closing trial balance. And you can take a look at that, and you can see the original values as well as the fact that as at the end of this period, as a result of that journal, we're now at zero in a number of those accounts, and you've got carry forward amounts in the balance sheet. So a great set of capabilities there for the back office. So moving on, I think you'll agree we're making great progress on the ACT Global capabilities, and there's lots more coming. Uh, let's talk about Be Local for a few minutes. So you heard yesterday how we're being local to the core ourselves. We're taking our organization more and more international with all aspects of our, of our business. And we've been focusing on taking the product into many of these locations as well, focused on seven key economies, Kevin C. Markets, which also represent, by the way, where you're growing your businesses yourselves when we see where we're signing new customers and where you're adding new subsidiaries. But don't worry if you're not in one of these seven countries, because the work that we're doing is common across many more countries as well. In Europe, we're spending a lot of time thinking about markets like Germany and France. We've recently been recertified in Germany for, with the IDW PS880 standard, which is a very deep audit of our accounting capabilities to meet the German standards. And in France, we've also been certified with the uh, FEC requirements. And we're also working on country-specific capabilities for those markets as well. Um, in France, we're working on a capability called Latrage, which is a feature so French that if you Google it, it refuses to translate what that means for you. In uh, Latin America, we've long had a great product for Mexico. Um, but I'm really, really proud to announce at this sweet world that we're now ready for Brazil-based services businesses. 
And if you're familiar with Brazil as a market, if you're operating there, if you're transacting there, you'll understand that Brazil is the most complex of all of the compliance markets around the world. And this has been a project in, in, uh, in progress for many years. So congratulations to the team that's working on that, that's been working on that, and thanks to the customers and partners that have contributed also. And in Asia Pacific, uh, we're continuing to improve the product for Japan. It's an important market for us still. We're also hard at work on um, adopting the new tax requirements for India. Uh, they transitioned to GST and TDS very recently. And we've also released our own localization for ERP in China that will continue to, um, to improve as well. But let's take a look at a couple of those country-specific features in action. So in Brazil, it's very important that we enable installment capabilities for you to transact with your customers and, and meet the way that they actually like to pay for those, uh, those transactions. So we've added enhancements to the terms capability in the product. Um, and here's an example of that. Um, we're adding a new term for five monthly installments. We're going to specify that that is an installment type of term. Um, we're going to specify that you can uh, that you're going to basically pay for each of those installments within 10 days from when they're due. We could have chosen a specific specific day in the month. Uh, we're going to select five monthly recurrences, and um, we have a couple of options here about splitting it out. You can split it evenly, or you can customize how you want to break down this transaction for how your customers are going to pay. So once we've saved this term, it's now available for us to use on the Brazilian version of the invoice form. So here we are. We've pre-populated some of the information for this particular transaction. And when we go to the billing tab, and we'll select the term for five monthly installments that we've just selected. And when we do that and go look at the installments tab that's now available on this particular invoice, you can see that we've broken down all of the appropriate amounts for each of the installments for this invoice. When we go ahead and save this, we can see on the uh, billing subtab again the breakdown of all of those installments and the due dates for them individually as well as the amounts and then the status so that you can see actually how the payments for this progress over time. And then last but not least, because this is tied into Sweet Tax for Brazil, you'll see that we've actually calculated all of the taxes for this transaction for the Brazilian market. And when you take a look at the tax details tab, you can actually see just how complicated that is for Brazilian customers. So all of that's now automated seamlessly inside the, uh, the NetSuite product for Brazil. Congratulations to the teams working on that. So we're focused on being local. Um, we're thinking about how to innovate in that, in that context to, to really drive the user experience specifically for customers in, in key markets. And China is a very special market in that regard. You may be familiar with a product called WeChat. This is really the platform for everyday life for more than a billion Chinese citizens, actually. And they're actually expanding these capabilities into the enterprise. So we've been collaborating with the Oracle development team in Beijing, and we've put together a proof of concept of how we think the future of expense reporting might look in China. So here we have a Chinese mobile phone. And in the bottom right-hand corner there, we have the WeChat icon. If we click that, we can pull up uh, the WeChat app. Oh, and by the way, I've just eaten at a local restaurant called Starbucks. So I'm going to pull up my receipt from Starbucks. I'm going to scan that. It's going to populate the information about that receipt. It's going to communicate with the local government. And it's going to return to me the formal Chinese invoice for a Starbucks transaction. And we're going to hold on to that in our WeChat app. We're going to transition into WeChat at work, where we've deployed the Oracle NetSuite expense reporting capabilities. And we're going to fill out some information about our expense report. And my Mandarin skills tell me that I'm entering an overtime meal expense report here. I think that's correct, guys. Um, and once I've done that, I'm going to select all of the individual um, expenses that I'm going to submit. And once I'm done, I'm going to submit that. Within the WeChat at Work app, my manager will get notified on her phone. When she goes into the WeChat app, she can approve that directly in the WeChat at Work application. And then I'll immediately be notified back on my phone that that has been approved. This will then flow seamlessly into the NetSuite expense reporting capabilities that we've all seen before. But here we are running that in China. And when we click on the link, we can see the, uh, the FAPIAO, the Chinese formal document from, uh, for that particular expense. So these are the kinds of things that we're doing in order to meet the be local expectations for markets like China and beyond. So thank you. So 
Global Financials, we're continuing to enhance these capabilities to support you and your business growth around the world. It's the foundation for everything we're doing. It's the center of the suite. And remember, it's not just in those seven countries, but also in the next 20, and the next 20, and the next 20 after that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. And I hope um, you can see how these great new capabilities are useful if you're headquartered in this, one of these countries, if you do business in one of these countries. But many of these features, things like auto cash, two-stage payments, they're really useful for all companies around the world uh, in the United States, Canada, anywhere. So um, great stuff. So no matter where your business is done, your biggest asset is your employees. And um, this is why we've made such a deep investment in HR. We announced Sweet People last year. And um, in the spirit of using your people effectively, and you know what they say is, you might not have heard this expression that good artists create and great artists delegate. Um, I'd like to bring up one of the newest members of our team, our leader of HR products, Hanif Ismail. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Evan. Good morning, Vegas. Come on, you got to do better than that. Good morning, Vegas. There we go. Now I like it. <laughs> you know, when you think about Vegas, you think about the hotels, you think about the restaurants, you think about the bars, but you think about the shows and then the pool decks. Ah, oh, yeah. But we'll stop right there. But what's the common thread across all of that experience that you go through that makes you want to come back? It's the workforce, it's the employees. That's what I'm here to talk to you about today. And that is sweet people. So first I'd like to thank all of our customers here today. We launched sweet people last year with core HR and payroll for the US market. And we've seen some tremendous success. We've had over 600 customers thus far and the momentum just continues. So what is Sweet People? Sweet People is a technology foundation that powers your HR organizations. And it powers it in three ways. One is that it helps enable growth. It modernizes your HR organization and it engages your workforce. From a growth perspective, it allows you to consolidate all of your HR data into one central repository. From an operational efficiency standpoint, it allows you to automate your workforce life cycle. And then it supports you from a compliance standpoint as well. From a modernization standpoint, it allows you to react to changing business conditions very rapidly. It provides you analytical support. It provides you productivity tools. From an engagement standpoint, it allows you, it allows one employee to recognize another employee. And then it provides you self-service capabilities where you can access that from the browser or through a mobile experience as well. So there are four areas that I'm going to focus on today of innovation. The HR dashboard and the headcount snapshot. It's really important for you to have insight to what your headcount trends look like as you're managing the growth of your company. The other is I'll introduce to you a new integrated recruiting solution that'll help you drive better quality hires, but it'll also help you scale your hiring process. And then I'll introduce you to an employee onboarding solution. And the onboarding solution helps get your employees productive from day one. And then finally, I'll talk to you about a payroll dashboard that helps your payroll administrator get efficient, but it also helps improve the integrity of your payroll. So let's start with a demo of an HR dashboard and the headcount snapshot. So this is something that you're already probably familiar with. This is the HR dashboard. And this is where an HR generalist can take action. And the action that they can take is from the reminders. They can also see various KPIs that are out there for them. We are going to go straight into the headcount analysis. 
And what we're going to explore is the Q1 data here, which is the new snapshot capability that we've introduced. You'll see the hires are at 50. So we've hired 50 new people in Q1. Our turnover seems a little higher than we expected. So we're going to take one of those resources and repurpose them for a key sales manager posi position in the West Coast. So what we're doing here is we're creating a job requisition. Based on our job definition tables, it'll bring up the associated job description, the salary range, and various other details. We'll plug in some more information here with the open date. We'll plug in the targeted hire date, who the hiring manager is, which is Brandon Russell, and a few other parameters. And then we'll save this. So what we've just done is created a job requisition in Sweet People. But the story doesn't end there. Today, I'd like to announce an, a new, uh, the general availability of an integrated recruiting solution with Teleo Business Edition. This is one of the biggest benefits of being part of the Oracle family. This product has over 5,000 customers globally, and it has a rich set of features from a recruiting standpoint. So now, you don't just stop at creating the job requisition in Sweet People, you can take this all the way and complete the entire recruiting process. So let's take a look at this. So this is the dashboard for Taleo Business Edition. And we'll go straight into my requisitions. We'll dig into there. We'll look for the job rec that we just created, which is the sales manager position. There it is. It's at the top. We'll open that up. And what you'll notice is that it carried over all the information from Sweet People over into Taleo. The experience is fairly close to what you see in Sweet People as well. So the recruiter here could actually go in and do a search for the best fit candidate. But instead of that, she's gonna, uh, she met Matthew a little while ago, a candidate. And she feels that he might be a good fit for this position. So she's going to directly associate Matthew to that requisition. And then let's assume we went through the entire recruiting process. So we went through the interviewing process, the ranking process. We extended an offer to the individual. Matthew accepted it. Now at this point, we're going to convert this over, convert the candidate over to a new hire. It'll ask us for some more information, like hire date. We'll plug that in. We already have his manager's name that got pulled in, Brian Russell. We'll plug in the start date. And let's give the chap $130,000. And we'll save this. So now what we've done is it'll create a record in Sweet People. We're in Sweet People now. You see Matthew Maynard in there. And it's pulled down all that information from Taleo into Sweet People. No double keying. Pretty cool. So. Thank you. So let me now introduce to you an employee onboarding solution. This is a solution that's currently in development, and I'm going to give you a preview to this solution. So the first step in the solution is to set up an employee checklist. So we're going to search for Matthew, who now exists because he's in Sweet People. We'll plug in. It pulls up some information about him. We'll plug in a coordinator, and we'll probably assign him to his HR generalist, Gina Parker. We'll leverage one of the pre-existing configured templates. And you'll notice a series of tasks that appears, anything from ordering a laptop to HR orientation. And you'll also notice that it's assigned to the appropriate person. But let's assume we want to add one more task into this. We want his manager to introduce him to the key accounts that he's going to be working with. So we'll enter that in. We'll plug in a date, a due date, and we'll pick May the 30th. And we'll assign this to both his manager, Brandon, as well as Matthew himself. So they jointly own this particular task. We'll then click on Add, and we'll add it to the checklist, and then we'll save it. So now what we've done is created an onboarding checklist for Matthew. So let's assume Matthew started a couple of days ago. He's on his dashboard right now, and he wants to continue working on his tasks. He notices that he's completed a few tasks there. 
And he wants to look at, ah, maybe I'll do my direct deposit, but he thinks about it and he says, I don't have all my information for that right now, but I want to order my business cards. But I want to do that through NetSuite's procurement application. All the information from Suite People pre-fills that information that you see there. He selects 200 cards that he wants to order. He submits it. And this just went through the purchasing system. Pretty cool. And now he goes back to his dashboard, his employee dashboard, and he sees that that record is sitting there and it's pending supervisor approval. So now let me share with you a payroll dashboard. This is actually in beta right now. So this is a dashboard that's designed for a payroll administrator. So in this case, Patricia Pace, who's the payroll administrator, is going to create a batch payroll right now. She clicks on creating a payroll. It'll automatically select who are the right employees for this. What you'll notice is it says the batch summary, and it says $621,000. There's enough funds in there to cover that, so that's good. But the variance on this is 4%. So she needs to investigate that. She looks at the list of employees there, and she finds Emily on that list having a pretty high variance amount. That doesn't look right. So she's going to look into that a little more and drill into it. And she looks at that and she says the earnings doesn't look right. There's a significant amount of gap there. So she drills into that even further. And as she looks into there, she looks at it and says the bonus amount doesn't look right. It's 20000 She investigates it further and finds that it should actually be $2,000. I'd love that kind of a mistake on mine. So that now you, what you see is she saved it, and she comes back to that list, and Emily's no longer on it. Right? She then takes a look at the new hires that were put in, and we find our favorite hire there, Matthew. Everything looks good. She decides to commit the payroll. So you can see the efficiency that this improves from a payroll administrator perspective. But it also not just improves the efficiency, it improves the integrity of the payroll itself. So what's next? Where do we go from here? Well, we're going to be extending sweet people to product companies. And that includes labor intensive companies like manufacturing, like wholesale, like retail. We're going to be enriching our capabilities around part timers. And we're going to be supporting contingent labor as well. Having a full unified view of your entire workforce can be immensely strategically important. In the example that you see on that image on the right, you see at the top where you can see workforce di distribution. What that is is what's the makeup of your workforce? How many of them are contingent labor? How many of them are employees? Is that ratio right for your organization? And that's something you would need to take a look at. You can then correlate that to the cost structure that you see at the bottom for that particular employee segments and look at that and determine if that is right for you as well. From that perspective, you might even say, you know what, we need to rethink our location strategy as an example to reduce cost. So that's just one example of the value and the benefit of being able to see a unified view of that workforce. With that, I hope you've got the perspective that we're continuously adding innovation, enhancements that add more value for you. And I hope you enjoy the conference. If you haven't looked at Sweet People, I invite you to stop by our booths, take a look at Sweet People, have an amazing conference. Thank you very much. There you go. Thanks, Anif. Great stuff. OK. Ah, technology, my happy place. Um, we're continuing to build and leverage world-class technology to give you the agility and the scalability to grow. Let's take a look at some cool stuff that we're doing. OK, so first of all, being part of Oracle has allowed us to deliver more for you. So we have more R&D investment. We talked about that earlier. And you know, Mark mentioned it yesterday. Um, but we're leveraging Oracle technology really across our whole stack. So on the infrastructure side, we're going to take advantage of Oracle Cloud infrastructure, the public cloud, to deliver NetSuite in your location, you know, with the best 
possible reliability and performance. We're using some of the great technologies in Oracle's database. They're multi-tenant, pluggable database, um, Oracle X7 servers, database as a service. This is great stuff that's just going to make uh, NetSuite work even better. On the technology front, uh, technology services, we're going to talk a little bit in a minute about uh, investment in, in, and partnering with Oracle on Growl JavaScript, uh, their AI platform, uh, the integration cloud service for how we're integrating to some great uh, tools. And in fact, on the applications front, you just saw Taleo Business Edition. We also have some very sophisticated um, uh, integrations with their planning and budgeting cloud and their warehouse management cloud. And that's just the beginning of how we're going to leverage the sort of elements of Oracle's uh, great offerings to make NetSuite work even better for you. I'm really excited about this. I mean, my team knows I've been pushing this hard. I mean, we chose JavaScript as the language of NetSuite over a decade ago. And we believe it was a great choice. It allows you to write client uh, code, server code. They all can, can work together, anything from simple customization to sophisticated suite apps. Um, but JavaScript is not standing still. Right now, we support ECMAScript 5.1. ECMAScript is kind of the standard behind JavaScript. Um, but there's new versions of ECMAScript. ECMAScript 2018 has powerful new language features, uh, classes, proxies, asynchronous functions, collections. Uh, and we're partnering with Oracle, with their server technology team. Uh, future versions of NetSuite will support the latest version of ES uh, specifications, starting with ES 2018. So Suite Script developers can leverage the most modern language, its native support, uh, makes the co code more readable, more maintainable, faster to develop, higher performance. Um, and that's really going to accrue to the applications and extensions that are built on top of NetSuite. On the integration front, uh, we've always had integration APIs. The real old timers here might remember SMB XML. Uh, moved on to SOAP, and then we added RESTlets, which allowed you to use REST to do custom integrations. But we, we see the direction. It's going towards REST across the board. And we're going to make it even easier to use REST. We're going to offer REST out of the box for all scriptable records, standard or custom. The API is standards-based. The services are discoverable programmatically. And it's not just your standard CRUD operations. You know, we're really getting in the weeds here. But uh, CRUD is good. <laughs> But um, even more, we're going to actually enable a, an action-based API. So you'll be able to directly do powerful uh, ERP operations, for example, things like uh, uh, fulfilling a sales order or, um, or committing a, a payment. And, and these will be, uh, just like you see buttons on the UI, those will be available directly uh, from REST. So really excited about growing, growing RESTful. We've talked over the past couple years about Suite GL. So that's taking our customization capabilities and applying them to the core GL of NetSuite. And there's several components. We have custom GL lines, we have custom segments, and we have custom transactions that I've shown um, in previous Suite worlds. And now we have a next generation of custom transactions that inherit all the functionality of sales or purchase transactions. And then you can configure the actual GL impact of those transactions. You create your own local and vertical uh, specific transaction types. It has full support for items and tax. Um, and you can build them in your standard workflows. Let's take a look at how that works. We're going to show how this functional functionality works in a sort of industry specific example and then a country specific example. So first, we're going to create a new transaction type called a pro forma invoice. It has all the functionality of an invoice but it's non-posting. Um, this is used in, in uh, several industries and in a bunch of different uh, localities. Uh, I mean, all, you've seen before that you can create your own uh, numbering scheme. You can create your own statuses. And importantly here, you can define that this type of invoice is non-posting. Um, so then if we go ahead, it builds it automatically into the menu system, choose to create a pro forma invoice. Um, it looks and acts like an invoice but it's own, its, its own uh, separate transaction type. So we can add items. Um, it's going to handle all the inventory. It's going to handle all the taxes. Um, everything is there as it is on the built-in uh, sales, sales transaction types. Save this transaction. And uh, we can take a look at the GL impact of this transaction. It has its own number, uh, et cetera. Let's go look at the GL impact, and we'll see that, in fact, 
Um, it does the accounting as we would like, and it's non-posting. Now we're going to take another uh, look at another example of using custom transactions in an international setting. So we have a transaction type that we're using for Brazil. It's called a Nota Fiscal Simples Remessa, and I pronounce that at least as well as Mateus said, Doritos bath. Um, and so uh, we're going to choose that it's going to affect a particular account. Again, it can have its own prefix for numbering and its, uh, its own scheme for numbering. It can have its own status. And in this case, we are saying that this is going to be a posting transaction. It has different types of GL impact than a regular invoice or, or sales order or other sales transaction. Um, when we create this, again, has the items as always. It's going to do the inventory. Um, all the costing that you need. It's going to do taxing. And if we look at the GL impact, we have the GL impact Im impacting uh, inventory and the type of tax impact that we need, need to do uh, for Brazil. And then when we look at a report, we can see our nota fiscal in the, in the report um, as any built-in transaction would be. So next generation custom transactions for sales and purchase transaction types coming to a NetSuite near you. I'm super excited about this. I mean, we have powerful customization. I always tell the story that, you know, when we started NetSuite, I, I, I didn't really know that much about accounting, but I definitely knew how to build uh, customizable business applications. And so we've had, we have great customization. You can, you know, really easily uh, tailor NetSuite uh, for your use case, but you have to do it in a few different places. If you want to uh, change names, if you want to change what people can see, there's a bunch of different places uh, you have to go. Well, we're creating a new, easy, and record-centric approach to record customization to help you view customizations and configure any record type standard or custom in one place. You do it once, and it propagates throughout the system. So let's take a look at that. So we're going to do customization on a standard uh, sales order record. I'm going to rename the record and set up some field access. The first thing you'll see is that we have something new called the Customization Manager. And the customization manager takes your customizations and shows you them from a sort of record-centric point of view. You can see everything you've done. You can search for, wh well, what have I customized on the sales order? We'll look actually at the customization for the sales order record. And that's going to include uh, things like the, the data model, the fields that we've added, the sub-tabs that we've added. Um, you can edit things about the record in some cases, but it's a built-in record. We can't change the account. Um, we can't change some aspects of the record. And you'll see that from which fields are editable. Um, beyond just looking and really easy access to custom fields and create new custom fields, you're going to be able to create custom fields on a record-specific, uh, transaction-specific uh, basis. Uh, we can look at some of the presentation uh, information, like the forms and numbering and where it is in the UI with links. And then we can look at the workflows and scripts that are affecting this record. And then we have an access tab. Those of you may, uh, familiar with custom fields may have seen this for custom fields. Now you can do it for standard fields. Instead of having to hide things on forms and, and limit what searches people can see, I can just say that this particular role should only have a view access to a particular field on the record. And when I make that change, it's going to, again, propagate throughout the entire system. So I change the name of the record to order. And you can see that now it's called order instead of sales order. That will be everywhere. And you can see for this user, um, they only have a view access to the, to the fields that we, that we specified. And, and hiding a field from a particular role all throughout the system, again, is just one click. They will have, it will be completely secure. They'll have no access uh, to that field data. So one place to go to make the changes that you need to make NetSuite work for you. All right, well, really excited about our fifth annual Hackathon for Good. Um, we had 75 customers, partners, and NetSuite employees that teamed up, stayed in a room with no, uh, with only artificial light for an entire day, but that's sort of Vegas style, isn't it? I think they pumped oxygen in, actually. And um, they solved challenges for two of our great nonprofit uh, customers, the Girl Scouts of America and Ability Center. So the Girl Scouts of America probably doesn't need uh, any introduction, but there are 1.8 million girl members, um, and their councils manage activities conducted in their territory through a collection of engaging, challenging, and fun activities. 
Uh, one of the things they do, you might be familiar with this, they sell cookies. And so what our team's built was uh, something to help them uh, more effectively sell cookies. The Ability Center, it's a charitable organization in Canada. They have a 125,000 square foot health and wellness center. Um, and I, I don't know, Craig, can you translate that to metric? Uh, and 200,000 visitors a year of all abilities, ages, and backgrounds can engage them, engages them in a variety of programs around the core program pillars of sports and recreation, health and wellness, arts and culture, life skills and employment. And so, the winning teams for the fifth annual hackathon are Team Sweet Girl and Team Ability Maker. <laughs> uh, for the Girl Scouts, Team Sweet Girl created an app for finance administrators as simple, the cookie dough credit creation process. Get it? Cookie dough? Dough? Yeah. Uh, automating the settlement between councils and the parent organizations for the credit that uh, Girl Scouts get when they sell cookies. Um, and they also, they had enabled complete visibility to dough credits, um, providing a robust dashboard for metrics and entirely eliminates manual work. For Ability Center, team Ability Maker leveraged the organization's current website to enable customers to create bookings that will directly create transactions in NetSuite. The solution eliminated the requirements of book calendar events in Outlook. It uses the calendar of NetSuite to room bookings. I want to thank, thank, thank Ability Center, Girl Scouts of the USA for joining with us, the social impact team that put this together, and the over 75 participants for joining us at this year's hackathon. OK, I want to add a little reminder. We want to work together to support and raise awareness for this fantastic cause. Childhood cancer doesn't get much more fantastic as a cause than that. Um, and Jim strong-armed me into raising the stakes on this one. We have the possibility of raising $50,000. That equals 2,000 hours of research, treatment for 100 children with cancer. And all you have to do is use hashtag give back to Alex on something you post. Maybe it's Alex's lemonade stand, photo, anything at Sweet World. If you don't understand how to do this, call your children. <laughs> and I mean, let's do it. Let's get $50,000 for childhood cancer research. So thanks everybody that's done that. And everybody else who doesn't, after this presentation, get out there and share. Every year, we award the Your Suite Award. It re recognizes a customer who's built the most innovative and impactful solution using the Suite Cloud platform. So we have two finalists. They're both fantastic. Uh, UES is an e-commerce logistics services company in Uruguay. They provide warehouse management and package distribution for their customers. They're the largest private postal services company in Uruguay, headquartered in Montevideo. Um, they build a self-service web management application that uses NetSuite CRM, ERP, and Suite Commerce to allow customers to have visibility of their stock levels, make delivery requests online, observe historical reports, and track distribution of packages. Our other finalist is Magnets USA, personalized specialty manufacturer of magnets for marketing for the real estate industry. They're headquartered in Vinton, Virginia. They use NetSuite Suite Commerce Advanced to automate and streamline their sales processes complex work orders, and it interfaces directly to their web and print services. So this is what is very difficult. I mean, we basically almost had to flip a coin. But the winner by a nose is Magnets USA. I'd like to welcome to the stage the COO, Donnie Martin, and the IT director, Jay Forrester. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for the great stuff you've built in NetSuite. Here you go. It's, uh... <laughs> great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Another big area of investment for us on the technology front is our next generation UI framework. So the whole idea of this is for both us, our partners, our customers to quickly and easily deliver tailored user experiences with a fresh consumer look and feel, rich interactivity options. 
uh, we've created an entire NetSuite design system with a catalog of reusable components. It's already being used. Some of the things you're seeing today are built on this new UI framework. Um, and we're going to expose the catalog and these uh, advanced UI capabilities to our platform developers. Developers, let's take a look at the catalog um, and some of the things that we're doing to make NetSuite better for every user. So the NetSuite design system, and what you're seeing here, is actually built on the new UI framework. It exposes components that you can use on your pages and that we're going to be using on our pages. The next generation data grid with draggable, uh, resizable columns. Um, this is how you're going to view uh, grid-like data in NetSuite in coming versions. You can drag and drop um, the different columns. You can, this is the code, very simplified code that you'll be able to use if you're extending NetSuite with this data grid. We have locked columns on the data grid, and uh, you can. This is something that's going to be super useful, I think, on the sales order when you can lock the different columns on the item sublist. So that's again coming in a future version of NetSuite. People, I think, will love that. And then lists. So you're choosing data in NetSuite all the time. We've reconceptualized how you choose data in a list. The multi-select, always kind of a weird interaction. I think we've done a fantastic job of making it simple to see which things you've chosen, choose things, unchoose things. And again, this is how multi-selects are going to work um, in, all, in all of NetSuite. And this is how you'll, the multi-selects will work as you extend NetSuite and add your own capabilities. So the next generation UI framework, it's already there. In some places, it's going to be coming really soon um, all over the product. That's great. Thank you. So we continuously strive to make NetSuite better for you. And I want to thank everybody that's given us fantastic feedback. We have what we call field trips. We send engineers and product managers, everybody on our team, out to visit customers, see how they're using NetSuite, see what things they love, what things we can do better. You guys are doing a great job in filling out your net, your, uh, net promoter score. Uh, how likely are you to recommend us to a friend or colleague and why? And we really, really look at that and, and figure out how we can uh, satisfy you better. Well, we want to make it even easier and faster to give feedback on particular areas of the product. So in an upcoming version, everywhere in the product, you're going to see a feedback link at the top. And whatever you're feeling at that particular point in time, you can tell us. Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you very sad? Are you very happy? Choose that and tell us why. And this is great, super easy. We'll be you know, scouring this to figure out uh, how we can make NetSuite better for you. So I thank you in advance for giving us feedback to help us improve the product. So next up, I'd like to introduce another new member of the team, um, Yoav Bali, uh, is going to show us what we're doing in Suite Analytics. Come on up, Yoav. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I know how near and dear to your heart Sweet Analytics is. And being a new member of the team, I'm really honored that you let me do these uh, exciting new, hey. Wait, 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 wait. Are you, are you announcing doing? what I think you're announcing? Yeah, I thought no, that. No, 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 no. I get to do this. I get to do Seriously? this. Seriously? Oh, Give man. me that flicker. Oh, come on. Seven years ago, we told you you'd be able to pivot data in that suite. <laughs> I would like to announce that Sweet Analytics is in beta now. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. Yeah, I also would like to thank all the customers that are in beta with us and have provided us um, amazing feedback over the last couple of weeks and months. Um, this feedback is really invaluable. Please keep it coming. It helps us make our product even, even better. Oh, and as you can see, we got, we got raving reviews so far. If it's not too late, if you want to join the beta program, please feel free. Drop us a note at beta.suiteanalytics at netsuite.com, and we'll definitely can, can hook you up. So, let me demo you a couple of the new capabilities that we have built. Um, we have uh, extended suite analytics with queries, pivots, and charts. 
And um, in order to do so, I will disclose with you a little secret and don't tell NetSuite. But I actually run a side business. Uh, in addition to my role at NetSuite, I'm also the CEO of Lucky Equipment. Lucky Equipment sells casino equipment to all the large casinos here in the US. So if any purchasing folks from the Venetian of Palazzo are here, let's talk. Uh, and let me show you how, as CEO of Lucky Equipments, I would like to analyze sales and, and see how, how my business is going. And by the way, all of the new suite analytics capabilities have been built on the new UI framework, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, so the first thing I have to do before I can start analyzing the data is I have to build a query. And for that, we, we use this query builder here. Um, I already have taken the sales order record. I've chosen a couple of fields, like the discount and, and the total. And what I will do next, I would, I would like to bring in the product category. So I do a join with the item record, and I drag and drop the product category uh, to the table. Then a new cool capability I would like to demo is multi-level join. If I want to do multiple jumps, I go, in this case, from sales order to location, from location to the address record, and there I pick the city in which the sales has occurred. With that, I have all the data fields I would like. It's actually 205, but I don't want to see all of them. I will define a criteria that only shows me the records of the last two years. So I take the date record, I click on on or after, and I type in 1st of January 2016. That filters only on the newest records that I have. That gives me a total of 82 records, and now I can start my analysis. So I click on the pivot tab. First thing I would like to do is to build a pivot. I would like to look at year-over-year -year sales. So I take the total into, into the values. I take the year into the columns. And I would like to look at year-over-year -year sales per quarter first. So I take quarter into, into the rows. In order to read the number easier, I will reformat them. I don't want to see them in absolute. I will see them in thousands of, of US dollars. Here we go. And as we can see, I had pretty steady growth in my sales across all four quarters. That's great. Let's see how I did across product categories. Easy swap between item and quarter. And I see even the product categories did very well. Last one, I would like to check how my sales per city went. Let's see. Oops, Atlantic City didn't really perform. So let me see if I can figure out what happened there. May, let me bring back the quarter, and let me see if I can see um, the sales per city per quarter. So I build a pivot hierarchy. And not that I need it for the demo, but it's a cool feature, so I show it. I, we can build totals and, and grand totals, and it looks really nice on the table. Um, and what we can see is actually that in the second half of 2017, our sales declined dramatically, and I would like to figure out why. So I will use another cool capability, which is our charting, and I will start analyzing a couple of sales dimensions. So first, I would like to look at the average order value. So I do an average on the total. I again do it on year and quarter, and I look at city. I don't want to see it at column chart. I would like to change it to a line chart. And I will filter out the cities I'm not interested in looking at right now. So the average order value is actually fairly flat. There's a small dip towards the end, but I don't think that's what's uh, causing the decline. Let's look at average discount. Maybe there's a spike in the discount that we had to give. There's a small spike, but it's not significant enough to, to cause the dramatic drop in sale. The last one I can look at is um, the number of deals that we have done. So let's, let's have a look at that. We do a count over order. Ah, here we go. That's a pretty significant drop in number of deals. Let me see if I can figure out why that happened. Let me build a new query, and let me try to build a headcount trend graph. So I use the headcount record from Sweet People. I will add a couple of um, criteria filters. First, I only want to focus on sales employees, so I go on the department and filter on sales, only on the active sales employees, and only the ones from Atlantic City. I again will look at it as a, as a line chart over time. 
And what it shows me is that in Q3, from Q2 to Q3, we actually had a pretty significant drop in terms of sales reps in Atlantic City. We started rehiring them in Q4, so I don't think it's a systematic problem I have in Atlantic City. I think if I keep hiring sales representatives, I will get the sales in order there. And with that, you know, I concluded my analysis. As mentioned before, we are in beta now, and feel free to join and provide us your feedback. And I've shown you most of the capabilities in, in, in the short demo. For the GA release, we plan to improve our charting capabilities by adding more chart types. Right now, you can build your queries on top of records and fields. We will allow you to build queries on top of queries you already have defined. Uh, for GA, and we will also plan to uh, extend our pivot capabilities with calculated fields. We will um, also increase our data coverage over the next few releases, and we will make our pivots and charts much more intelligent. Um, also, we have not forgotten about our developers. Any of you here? None? <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Uh, so spread the word to your developers, but in fact, every new sweet analytics capability will be API enabled. In beta, we started with our uh, query API. We will uh, improve our API by adding pivot and charting capabilities to it. And last but not least, I would like to also introduce the concept of analytical applications. Analytical apps um, are basically pre-built analytical content to solve analytics needs for specific functions or industry. Like, for example, the sales analysis I've shown you or the merchandise hierarchy that uh, Allison has showed you earlier during the keynote. Um, the apps come with predefined queries, calculated metrics, pivot tables, and charts, and they will be accessible through an analytics dashboard. You will be able to drill down to pivots and charts from the dashboards to continue your analysis. And um, oh yeah, I, I almost forgot the best part of them. NetSuite will build many analytical applications for you. And of course, you can build them yourself, but we will provide some for you right out of the box. Thank you. That's it for Sweet Analytics. Back to you, Evan. Thanks, Yoav. OK. It's really grow time now. We've saved the biggest news for last. Um, this is something that's been in the works for some time. We're really excited about bringing intelligence to the suite, what we call the intelligence suite, um, combining rich NetSuite data with the power of data science and machine learning to revolutionize how you work and make you more successful. So that's you know, the promise of everything we do. But this is very specifically about some of the great new technology in machine learning. So machine learning is great at things like pattern recognition, correlation, predictions, and recommendations. And with the right data over time, machine learning can enable systems to continuously learn and improve from experience. So how do you make a system smart? Well, this is going to be sort of machine learning 101. Now, this is what we're doing under the covers. You know, there won't be a test on this. Uh, we just want to tell you what happens in the NetSuite system uh, to give you this kind of rich intelligence. Wow, I just got attacked by a moth. That was cool. Um, they got, we're very excited about intelligence. Uh, and so there's really a couple different types of learning problems. One is called supervised learning, and that's putting things, for example, into classes or deciding yes or no. An example would be, is this a potential customer or not? Um, unsupervised learning is more about uh, taking a, a rich set of data and categorizing it without knowing in advance what those categories might be. Uh, things like how do you segment customers, what customers might be alike, and we might, might want to treat them uh, similarly from a marketing and sales perspective. Once you've defined the problem, then you need your data. Uh, rich data as much as possible. It's not just about the number of records, it's about the attributes. Things called features um, in data science allow you to uh, use the best possible inputs to try to learn. 
then you choose an algorithm, or in fact, will choose an algorithm. There's many different algorithms that are appropriate for certain types of problems, and that's really where the art of the science comes in, um, understanding what might be the best way to approach this particular learning problem. Once you've chosen an algorithm, you take the data and you train the algorithm on that data, and that gives you an initial approach to try to solve your problem. But very, very importantly is the feedback loop. Um, every new data point that goes through the model acts as a signal, giving the model feedback and enabling it to tune itself. Um, really, you know, all of these elements are important, but it, again, it really does start with the data. And NetSuite has rich data across your organization, ERP, commerce, HR, CRM. And we have data across the entire business ecosystem, 40,000 NetSuite customers. We sort of have anonymized data um, about all different types of industries that we can use uh, to make helpful insights. And finally, the Oracle Data Cloud, the largest repository of enterprise data in the world for even greater insight. So how does this all come together? Well, we're applying intelligence to NetSuite in three different ways. The first is insights. Don't just report on what happened, but actually predict what might happen next, sort of non-obvious correlations, um, which customers are most likely to pay invoices late, which projects are most likely to go over budget. Intelligent automation. Learn the tasks that users do repeatedly and do it for them. Uh, only present the exceptional cases. Uh, prioritize sales orders to fulfill. Find out sales orders that uh, may need some extra attention. You have a limited time in your day. You need to focus on the things that, are, that require uh, uh, your input. And then finally, uh, intelligent interaction. We spent a lot of time interacting with NetSuite. We want to make it as effective and productive as possible. On the dashboard, we want you to have the right content there. When you're filling out forms, we want to make that as seamless and efficient as possible. So let's take a look um, at how we're going to do this. We're going to, uh, there's hundreds of ways. I'm just going to show you a few. Uh, and we've thought about all the different ways we can apply intelligence across these three themes and across the entire suite from project resource assignments, customer segmentation, best fit hiring candidate prediction. Eventually, the, the intelligence suite will apply to every user and customer in NetSuite and help make them more successful. And I want to show a couple of specific examples. First, let's start with intelligent search and dizing. So search and dizing is an e-commerce capability to curate the search results for maximal impact. Uh, data science and the data we have across the suite will change the game in search and dicing. So what happens on sites? Well, shoppers frequently use search to find products, and giving them the right results is critical. Here we see a shopper searching for a jacket. How can we ensure that the top row of results is the results that the uh, shopper is most likely to buy? Conventional search uses keyword matching, plus you can make some manual uh, configurations, but what if we could learn and continuously improve the results? An example is synonyms. So in e-commerce, a synonym is a similar product with a different name, things like jacket versus coat. And in conventional systems, the user configures that, says when the user search for, searches for jackets, also show them coats. Um, and you might know some of those offhand, but there's actually a ton of uh, correlations there. By looking at thousands of shoppers' search patterns, Next, we can learn that customers shopping for jackets often are interested in coats. We can automate adding those into the, into the search results. We can leverage uh, all the commerce data in the suite. Um, this includes uh, shopper data, past purchases, browse behavior, uh, about this shopper, you, but also thousands of others. Predict which items the shopper is most likely to buy. So here's how we kind of can score the search results. Some of these items that we're showing on, on the basic algorithm actually haven't performed very well, and some of them perform really well. So let's rank based on that. Um, but it can go beyond just this commerce data. It can leverage data from all over the suite. Perhaps you'd like to sell your most profitable products. I don't know why that would be. But um, we can score results based on uh, profitability. So together, all these signals can be put together to weight the search results, displaying the results that the shopper is most likely to buy and that are the best for you. But the story doesn't stop there, because that's where we start. But everything a shopper does becomes a signal back into the, becomes a si signal back into the system. So if we get a certain set of results, maybe the user skips the first result. That's a negative signal, red. 
Uh, Sharper views the second jacket but doesn't buy it. That's a small positive signal. Sharper buys the third jacket. That's a strong positive signal. It's actually the fifth jacket here. Um, and the system uses this feedback loop to learn and improve for the next search by the next shopper. So the system is always working. The thing about these machines is they never get tired. That's why they're going to eventually take over the world. But in the meantime, we can take great advantage of them to improve your site search results 24-7, 365. Now, I want to shift gears and talk about intelligent insights and automation in the supply chain. So an order management analyst will use something called the supply chain control tower to proactively manage risks and prevent late shipments. So right here on the supply chain control tower, we can see a portlet that has predicted risks. And there's actually an order that we think there's a likelihood of 78% this order is not going to be delivered on time. Click on the Intelligent Insights icon. Why is that? Well, it's because the shipper has had a bunch of late shipments lately. And the, we expect to stock out in this uh, location because of high demand. So what are we going to do? Well, the system can actually make a recommendation for this order, we think the location of Charleston using the shipper Nuex shipping will be a better approach. And if you use that approach, we predict a 95% confidence on on-time delivery. So take a, we'll take a look at that, and we'll click Use Recommendation, and it'll make the change uh, directly on the order to increase the likelihood that we're going to give great customer service. So the supply chain, control tower, intelligent insights. So we talked also about intelligent interaction. So almost every user of NetSuite has to fill in forms. We're working really hard to think about how can we make the process of filling forms an easier. So let me show you uh, a demo of that. We call it the intelligent form assistant. This is a prototype, uh, but it's working in the labs on our new UI framework. So what it means is that for a particular role, we analyze what you do with this form, what other similar users of that role do with this form. An accountant editing a customer typically edits the price level, the terms, the credit limit, whether they're on credit hold. All those fields are right there on the right side of the page. And the intelligent form assistant, they get immediately, of course, mirrored on the main form. But a sales rep edits customers differently, company name, industry, annual revenue, uh, location, web address, et cetera. And so when a sales rep is adding a new customer, they can go directly to the intelligent form assistant to fill out the forms that they're most likely to be filling. For example, they have to put in the company name. They always have to uh, they, they choose an industry. And here's where we can do some interesting intelligence, because we can notice that wholesale distributors are usually not taxable. And so we uncheck that, and you can take a look, and the system will tell you why it did that, because almost all wholesale distributors are non-taxable. Um, and so you can fill out the rest uh, of the fields. Uh, annual revenue, again, we can make an intelligent insight here. When it has a high annual revenue, in this case, 6 million, typically their order priority is going to be 1. Um, and so that fills that out. It tells you why it did it. But in this case, we're saying, actually, we don't want that because the machines still don't actually control the world. Humans have some power. We're going to change, change the value. But again, it's all about uh, limiting the amount of work you have to do uh, to uh, fill out a form. And every interaction is a feedback loop. Every time you go over to the main form and fill something else out, that will help us decide what field should be in the intelligent form assistant in the future and adapt to how you work. I, thanks. Uh, some of you fill out forms, I guess. OK. So I'd like to finish up with dashboards. They were one of the first innovations of NetSuite. I, you know, when we initially launched the executive dashboard, Larry gave me a call and he said, OK, now I actually want to use your product. Give me a login became the product manager of the dashboard for the next coming months. And I, back in the day, I, he could call me and tell me he wanted something. Oh, I want a drop down so you can change the quarters that you're analyzing. Or I want this graph that shows sales by day over this same quarter last year, et cetera. Uh, so we've done some great work on dashboards. It's the first page you see when you log into NetSuite. Um, and we're really, really excited. We've built a team that's, that's prototyping and developing the next generation of dashboards. It combines several of the areas we've talked about today tailoring content for your vertical, analytics, intelligence about what content we show and how we can make your job easier. And it really leverages our future UI. So let's take a look at next generation dashboards. 
So here we are, Dex Johnson, a practice manager in a services company, and they get a dashboard. It looks a little different than what you've been seeing on um, the past. One of the uh, biggest differences is maybe the, the look and feel, um, but we actually let you change that. Maybe you want a dark. Uh, this is like well, how programmers would want, would want it. Uh, but let's go to the light, uh, normal person view. And uh, as you, you, the menuing system has changed. We're taking advantage of the fact that uh, many de uh, laptops, desktops are wide, and, you, and we want to use horizontal real estate rather than vertical. The entire menuing system can be collapsed, or when you view uh, what we call the mega menu, um, it's got everything all in one place. You don't have to kind of search through, and they're actually, it's categorized. There's a, a legend that tells you which type of page and which type of operation each link is. You can search for particular links. Um, on the uh, menu on the main page, we have suggested pages. Again, using intelligence to figure out what you've liked to do in the past from here and what other uh, users like you have done. And of course, you have favorite pages um, and, and uh, your recent pages. On the main dashboard itself, we have alerts and reminders and next generation of alerting uh, capabilities. We've shown this before. We're really excited about the work list. Everything you need to do right there in one place. For example, you can approve and reject expense reports. And now we bring in, uh, you can view it in a few different ways. You can view it as a card. I like the, the list view. Um, and it, there's, uh, we've highlighted some things that might need your attention. And again, using our intelligent assistance, we've determined that $800 for a lunch at Caesars Palace is actually outside the norm. Um, and so maybe this one is going to be on them. So we can go ahead and reject it. So that's the work list. Next, KPIs. We're reimagining how you want to see your key performance indicators. And we're going to show some of them in the same format before, but we're going to have next generation graphs and charts. You, for this uh, user, we can show you portfolio profitability, resource utilization, a bubble chart to show unbilled time um, by billing class. You can drill down easily to get more detailed information, in this case, about profitability. And uh, again, there's some intelligence here about what you might want to view. Other users like you um, have typically put an actual cost versus budget versus forecast graph. And oh yeah, that sounds great. I'm going to add that uh, to my dashboard with one click. Finally, looking at the records that you have to manage on a day-to-day -day basis, snapshots of your key projects, um, giving you some of the key metrics for those projects, and then surfacing what might be a problem. On budget confidence for this project, based on similar projects, is 30%. Oh, that doesn't look good. Let me drill down and learn a little bit more. Right down below, we have some very detailed metrics. And of course, you can drill down to the actual records to figure out uh, how you can address this. Now, this is what it looks like for a services user. A product company user is going to have a completely different dashboard, but a lot of these same capabilities. Their work list will be different. Their KPIs will be different. Um, but the interactions and the intelligence will be there for them. They see customer snapshots, maybe, instead of uh, project snapshots or order snapshots. Um, but ultimately, uh, we're trying to deliver the right information at the right time for you to be most effective in your business. So that's next generation dashboards. Thank you. So hopefully you've heard these terms a bunch and you've drank a bunch of uh, whatever you're drinking. I'm sure it's uh, hint water. Uh, <laughs> and so really, you know, we've tried to weave through this, these themes that we think are incredibly important to grow your business. Automation, insight, control, agility, and collaboration. We're going to continue to grow and work hard to deliver these for you. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening today. I would love to see you. If you uh, around looking at all the great content we have. Enjoy the rest of Sweet World and, Sweet World and let's grow. Talking with people, learn a lot from them. Talking about what you can get.